Golly goodness, is it November already? I really meant to do something special for Orktilber, but it's already November. How am I supposed to celebrate this amazing holiday when it's already over? Ah, uh, what would I know? I need some sort of orc specialist to really let me know what is the meaning of the season so that I can have a holly jolly orc tilber. Hello, Dana. It is me, billionaire influencer, Nobel Peace Prize winner, former CEO of Raytheon, and internationally recognized orc enthusiast, Tyler Russo, but also founder of the Bill and Melinda Gates Save the Squigs Foundation. You may recognize me from TV or from my various war crimes committed against the people of Marmageddon. Tyler, Tyler from Billion Dollar Clown Farm? How did you get Get in here. I appear to those who are true of orc spirit and orc heart and their greatest time of need. Also, you sent me an invite link via dropbox.com. You're an orc specialist. What would you suggest that I do to celebrate this amazing holiday even though it's already November? Orc Vember is the original pagan holiday before Games Workshop conquered the Anglo-Saxons in the mid-1400s. Orkfember, the original Orktober, is free of corporate showing in the evil talons of Codex release cycles to make end-of-year sales goals. Orkfember, the true Orktober, is free from sin, free from the cold hands of capital. It's about digging through your neighbor's recycling bin, diving into the dumpster of your local circuit city, dismantling compact computers, and rebuilding them at Estampas. It is the reappropriation of trash, the true Ork spirit, kitbash festivities, and using Playmobil models as battle wagons and insisting it is WYSIWYG and tournament legal because GW offers no model and the year is 2003. Also, you're nine years old and couldn't afford a battle wagon even if there was one. It was a holiday of thriftiness and taking. Are you saying that if I build some sort of vehicle based on orcs or grots or squigs, I'll understand the true meaning of this most amazing holiday October? When I was a boy, my parents would make me and my 600 brothers scrap cars for parts into Toys R Us parking lot. We were forced to disassemble them and build great war engines that towered over the suburbs of central Massachusetts. It would rain destruction upon the Lazar families. I had severe tetanus for many years, and only through sheer willpower and homeopathic monster energy drink based recipes was I able to free myself and grow to my current size. This is what we must do to honor the true work member tradition. We both must birth 600 sons and force them to fight in the Toys R Us parking lot. Or we could also do a kit bash challenge that would also be acceptable. But insert pre recorded dialogue here. Insert pre recorded dialogue here. I wish I knew the true meaning of Orktober so that I could hold it in my heart all the year long. The true meaning of Orkvember is super glue and toy cars from the dollar store. If these things are in your heart, Orkvember will always be with you. Wait, really? Yes, they must be inserted through self-surgery. I could probably do that. I use the GW branded self-surgery kit to perform mine. You can find them on their website at gamesworkshop.com. Can grots be involved too? What about snotlings? What about squigs? Grot is orc. Squig is orc. Snotling is orc. If orc believe hard enough, all is orc. So you're telling me if I kitbash some sort of orc vehicle, I'll learn the true meaning of Orktober? Yes. Are you sure about that? <laughs> yes. Alright, well I'm trusting you with this. I hope you know what you're doing. Me too. Let us begin. As Tyler said, Orktober is the holiday of building things out of trash. And in the spirit of that, we're going to build both an army that likes to build things out of trash, and we're also going to literally build something out of trash. And that army is the Grotbag Scuttlers. And while you may not have heard of the Grotbag Scuttlers, I assure you they do exist. They've been mentioned a total of three times in the Age of Sigmar battle tones. But Dana, you might say, do the Grotbag Scuttlers even have rules in Age of Sigmar? Well, sort of. Some people have made Grotbag Scuttlers armies using the rules for the Caradron Overlords, which are like the Sky Dwarves, but personally I think that's kind of sacrilege using goblins with dwarf rules? Are you kidding me? So let's consult the official goblin rulebook. In the official goblin rulebook, Gloom Spike Gits and other stories, we find that there is actually a rule set that exists that is actually completely compatible with these goblin sky pirates. And that rule set's not even really being used for anything because does anyone actually play Spider Fang? 
I didn't think so. For those of you unfamiliar with goblins in Age of Sigmar, there are some goblins who exist in the rulebook called the Spider Fang Goblins. They're sort of a sub-faction of the goblins as a whole. What all of the Spider Fang Goblins have in common is that they have the rules that say, because they're riding spiders, they effectively have the rules of a flying model because they can crawl up the terrain and, and stuff. So I'm like, well, we already have flying goblins in the rule book. Why don't we just build our Grotbag Scuttler's army and use those rules for the spiders that nobody's playing with anyway? So the official Got Grotbag Scuttler's rules, you heard it here, are just the rules for the spider fang. And uh, yeah, we're going to reskin them. So a couple months ago, I built this model as my grot bag. I mean, this is in the rule book. It's even called a scuttle boss. So I built this a few months ago. I kind of kit bashed it out of some parts from different orc kits and just stuff I had lying around. And this is the leader for my grot bag scuttler's army. So unfortunately, I didn't really go any farther than that. I didn't build the rest of the army um, and I've always been meaning to. So I thought that this collab was actually a great opportunity to build out the rest of my Grotbag Scuttler's army. I built this sort of prototype little rocket goblin a few months ago, and uh, it's kind of clutched together with some uh, poster putty and a little bit of glue. And as you can see, it's sort of built out of trash that I've had lying around. And by trash, I mean some of these parts are from expensive kits, but we're gonna just say we're building something out of trash to fulfill the requirements of this challenge. <laughs> For real though, we are gonna build a bunch of units based on trash. I'm going to be using the paint bottle lids and we're going to combine them with the pipes from a lot of the 40k terrain kits and we're going to build a unit of 10 goblin rocket riders which will use the goblin spider riders rules all right so first things first with kip bashing the first thing you got to do is cut your pipes i'm going to use my hobby saw to cut these pipes apart luckily they already have kind of a little scoring mark where you want to cut them so i'm just going to cut up a bunch of pipes and see what happens over time we're going to put some of these pipes together along with the paint bottle lids and uh make some rockets once we have the chassis of our rockets built we're going to need to find some way to make them look like they're floating above the bases. You can also note here, I'm using the regulation base sizes for Goblin Spider Riders to make sure that these are regulation forces. I bought these from gamesworkshop.com. So yeah, we're going to need some way to make these float above the bases. And I don't like using transparent rods. I think it looks kind of bad. I think what we're going to do here is the same thing I did with some of my Sisters of Battle I've been working on in the background and use a 40k kit uh, and just cut pieces off of it with our hobby saw and we're gonna kind of just have little pieces of rubble underneath the rockets and glue them on so they kind of look like they're flying over the pieces of ruins. Once that's done we can get to the fun part which is just covering these rockets up with bits and little goblins riding on top and stuff like that. So the kits that I'm using here I'm gonna be using the goblins from the Boingrop Bounders or squig riders set and because uh, they already look like they're kind of holding on like barely um you know what i mean and then we're also going to use pieces from a bunch of mechanical type kits i have lying around so we're going to use some orc kit pieces we're going to use some caradron overlords pieces to show that these have been stolen from caradron overlord settlements and just anything we have lying around to make these rockets I think the best way for me to describe my kit bashing process, because I can't describe how I picked every single part, is kind of like playing with Lego. I just have a bunch of parts that I think might work, and I try and fit them together in different ways until it makes something interesting that roughly fits what I have in my head. While we're doing all this kit bashing, I would like to encourage you to, when you're done with this video, go and check out that other half of this collab at Billion Dollar Clown Farm. Tyler is one of my favorite up and coming YouTubers and I highly recommend you check out his channel. He's only got a few videos up right now, but they're all extremely high quality, really well produced, and I find his content is both funny and informative. So after you're done here, go and check out the other half of our holiday special and make sure to subscribe to Billion Dollar Clown Farm and me, I guess, if you aren't already subscribed to this channel. 
So after we do that, we slap everything together. We put our goblins on top. We put our squigs on top. You can see they're already kind of painted because I clipped these off of something I was half finished painting. Sometimes that's how kit bashing works. Once we're happy with our kit bashed models, we're gonna finish these up by adding some basing paste all over the bases and all over the little terrain on the bases and even a little bit of basing paste on the rockets themselves to show that they're kind of dirty and rusty. And then we're also going to throw a bunch of other little bits and rocks and stuff onto the base along with the basing paste to make it look a little bit more lived in. After leaving all of this overnight, it's time to airbrush. The goal here is to come up with a very simple paint scheme to make up for all the time we spent up front doing the kit bashing. I want to be able to expand this army and I want to come up with a paint scheme that is relatively time efficient so that I can make more of these rockets relatively quickly. So we're going to get as much done with the airbrush as we can. A few days ago I came up with a test paint scheme for the Goblin Rocket Rider and I didn't really like it so we're just going to wing it and come up with something as we go. First things first, we're gonna base coat everything with a black matte primer. After that's done, we're gonna give everything a spray from above with a magenta ink. You could use any red or pink ink from this. If you have some Curios hair colored ink, you could use that or whatever you wanna use. After that's done, we're going to give the models a final spray highlight from above with a white ink. I'm using Liquitex white ink here because it's good stuff, you just gotta let it dry overnight, otherwise it cannot work very well. Once we're done with that, we're gonna do some relatively quick and dirty underpainting before we do our color glazes. I'm gonna try something new and fun here and use some extra different colors for our underpainting rather than just doing it in black and white. All of the terrain in our models is going to get a really quick and dirty wash of Drakenhof Nightshade because we're gonna go for sort of a blue tone for the terrain, I think. I'm using a relatively large brush here and not being too fancy with it, just going as fast as I can. Next, I'm going to use one of my secret weapons, which is a homemade contrast paint that works really well for sharp contrast and brown shadows. The mixture is a 50-50 mix of Agrax Earthshade and Liquitex Transparent Raw Umber. So if you have those two ingredients, you can make a really fun sort of contrasty paint. And again, using a very large brush, we're just gonna slop it all over the models, getting into those recesses and leaving some parts just completely white um, if there's no recesses. We want these models to look nice and rusty, so we wanna have some modeled patterns putting, just put this stuff wherever you want, it's just gonna look like oil or rust when we're done. As a final step, I was going to give all of these a quick dry brush with a pale sand. However, I ran out of pale sand and couldn't order some quick enough so today we're going to be trying out some new paints and some new brushes that were provided to us free by the Army Painter. Included in one of the paint sets that they sent me is this lovely pale sandish tone called Mummy Robes, which I think works pretty well for dry brushing because it's a relatively dry paint. And one of the things I'm really excited to use today is the Masterclass Dry Brush set that was provided to me by the Army Painter. I am in love with these brushes and I recommend that you check them out if you're interested in dry brushing or dry brushing is a large part of your repertoire. Because what they've essentially done is they've been watching YouTube, they know that we're using makeup brushes for our dry brushing and they've just made their own line of makeup brushes to use specifically for dry brushing. So they are these really soft brushes with um, wide flat heads but they come in a lot smaller sizes than a traditional makeup brush, so you can really get into those places. Anyway, they're basically like makeup brushes, but just better. And they're not even that expensive. They come in a set of three in three different sizes. Once again, this is not a paid promotion. They just provided to, these to me for free, and I really, really like them. So I would recommend you go check them out if you can. We're gonna use our largest dry brush to do some dry brushing over the entire model using mummy robes, which is again, pale, you could use pale sand or any sort of off-white for this. And we're just gonna get this done as quickly as possible. We don't wanna spend too much time on underpainting, but it is worth, you know, an extra five minutes per model to bring out those details. Once that's done, our final underpainted models are gonna look something like this and they're gonna be all ready for airbrush glazing. Now, I was inspired by this video from Brent over at Guru Town Hobbies to underpaint all of my models in pink before I paint them yellow because it 
it just looks really good. So the first thing we're going to do on our underpainted models in sp is spray everything with a magenta process ink from Dalarani and uh, just be pretty light with it. We don't need to thin it or anything and it's just gonna color everything in a nice filter of magenta ink. For our second step, we're going to use Wrap to Yellow, which was named by one of our patrons at the Name a Paint tier. You can find the actual title of the paint in the description. And while originally I was going to paint everything on the model yellow that I had painted pink, I actually found when I was painting it, it looked a little bit cooler to leave a few things in this magenta pink color. So I ended up actually doing a mix of some areas look really yellow, some areas look a little bit more orange, and some, love, some areas I just left completely pink. So just have fun with it. Once that was done, I thought I would paint all the bases in lime green ink to sort of continue this uh, gradient of warm to cool colors. And I thought it looked pretty good, so I kept doing it. Again, we don't need to thin this color at all. It's an ink, so it's perfect for glazing our underpainting. And I'm also going to use this same color to just spritz, put a little spritz of this color onto the goblin faces and hands to save us a little bit of time later. The final thing we're going to do with our lime green ink is we're going to spray it on the engines of the rockets. And you can see in the underpainting, I've already made the rockets fairly bright looking on the back. And what I'm going to do is just outline that white with the lime ink, and it's gonna create this really nice glowing effect. As a final step with our airbrush, we're going to use Liar's Blue, another color that was named for a Patreon, to rim all of the bases, as well as to give the bases a bit of a gradient, darkening the front of the bases and letting it fade into that lime green. This is gonna help it look a lot more like the glow from the engines is lighting up the base in this lime green glow. As I was doing this, I sort of came up with this story beat in my head where I'm like, oh, I bet these rockets are powered by warp stone and these goblins have some sort of arrangement with the Skaven where they trade them parts for warp stone to power their engines. That might be a cool little bit of lore for this army. While we have this dark blue out in our airbrush, I also used it to just tint and add little details to a few of the squigs and goblin robes just to add some interest. With our airbrush glazing complete, we can move on to our hand-painted details. Step one, we're going to use our off-white paint, either pale sand or mummy robes, to uh, paint all of the squig teeth the toenails on the goblins and the squigs, and the eyes on everyone. After that's done, we're gonna paint on some metallics. I didn't wanna overpower these models with metallics, but I thought it would look good to mix in a few metallic tones to just add some interest. So I've chosen to use a Vallejo Metal Color Copper, same as we used for our street sharks, I mean, oof, space sharks. Uh, models and uh, I'm just gonna pick out a few of the details with this copper color, the pipes, um, the grot armor, and just anything that really occurred to me that might look good in a copper tone. Step three for our hand painting, we're gonna apply a brown wash to all of the metallics and then just anywhere else we think needs to be a little bit shaded and have a little bit of a brown tone. I'm using Howl's Bane Curse for this step, which uh, if you haven't seen my previous video, is a mixture of Agrax Earthshade and Reichland Flesh Shade. I find it's the perfect mixture for a brown shade that's not too heavy and has a bit of a nice orange tone. You could use that or you can use whatever brown tone you want for this step. Step four, we are going to edge highlight all of the panels with our off-white color. So we're just gonna use our edge highlighting technique using a relatively dry off-white color, not thin too much. And we're going to just run our brush, the edge of our brush along the panel lines to highlight them and help them stand out. Step five, at this point we can start to really have some fun and I'm gonna bust out my Green Stuff World Liquid Rust Pigment Set to add some little grime and stuff to the models, which is one of my favorite things to do and one of the reasons I wanted to paint these models. 
The first thing we're going to do is we're going to use the orange rust liquid pigment to add a little bit more brightness to all the yellow tones and sort of tint them more into the orange spectrum. I've been experimenting a lot more with these paints and I find that they're really interesting. They almost work like a glaze, but they dry with a really matte finish and the pigments are very easy to move around on the model, allowing you to create some really interesting effects. So yeah, I'm just using these to brighten up the models in certain places, add some little rust effects to other places. Have fun with it. Step six, we're gonna use one of the verdigris paints from this set to add some verdigris to all of the copper because if you're having copper on your models, you gotta add some verdigris. It just, it looks good and it's gonna contrast really well with all of the orange tones on the model. I also added some of this verdigris color to some of the squig mouths, just adding little bits of highlights to add some interest. I thought it looked really cool. So yeah, always just make things look cool with little extra details. Adding more colors is almost always a good thing to do probably. And then as a final thing that I use this paint for, I also tinted some of the grot skin this blue verdigris color because it was fun to just add some variety and skin tone to the grots. It adds some interest to the army and it looks cool. As an optional side step, at some point during this painting process, I realized that I wanted to be fielding these grots as two squads of five sometimes, rather than always using them as one squad of 10. So I wanted to come up with something that was a little bit subtle to visually make the two squads distinct. So I decided to have squad B um, just have a few more rusted panels on their little rockets to make them look a little bit different than squad A. So here's my quick process of how I achieved this look. I mixed two drops Viejo Chocolate Brown with the turquoise oxide from the pigment set to create this really nice black brown rusted panel color basically. I then painted just some random parts of the rockets on the B unit in this color. After that, I lined these panels using a more sloppy version of the edge hiling process, just stippling on a bunch of little bits onto the edges of these panels. Then we're going to take our orange rust liquid pigment that we used before, and we're just going to stipple it onto the edge over top of those white highlights and sort of bleeding into different places, creating a rusted panel look. As a final step, we're going to add some hand-painted faction symbols onto these rusted panels because why not? It looks really cool. I figured these are sky pirates, so they should have their own Jolly Roger, just like every pirate fleet does in One Piece. Because they're goblins, they would have a little goblin skull kind of thing and uh, little crossbones underneath. And then I also added some little hand-painted writing next to it on certain models. And then to make it look like it had been there for a while, I just stippled a little bit of rust pigment on top of that hand-painted writing. Here you can see a couple variations of this that I, I tried to vary it up on each of the models and make it look a little bit different, a bit custom. And as our final step on these models, we're just gonna finish up the bases a little bit and I'm going to use our dry brush set to dry brush on some Vallejo blue green to highlight the bases a little bit and bring them a little bit more into the blue tone because I found the green was a little bit garish looking. So I'm just gonna dry brush on this blue green and then we're gonna use Vallejo pale sand to highlight that a little bit further. Once that's done, I'm just using a normal matte black color to rim the bases and our models are complete. Before we go, I'd like to extend a huge thank you to Billion Dollar Clown Farm for doing this collab with me. It was a lot of fun to organize. And you should definitely go and check out the other half of this collab where he builds a giant orc stompa out of trash. And uh, yeah, do yourself a favor and go check out Billion Dollar Clown Farm. In addition to that, I'd like to extend a huge thank you to all of my patrons on Patreon who make this channel possible. This week, I would especially like to thank Deli Sin, Arthur, and Miguel. If you'd like to become a patron, you can check out patreon.com slash Dana Howell and get access to having your name up here, bonus content, all kinds of other interesting perks. You can also follow me on Twitter or Instagram at Dana underscore Howell to keep up with my daily painting progress and see what I'm going to be up to next on this YouTube channel. Thank you so much for watching this video. Have a happy Orkvember, and I'll see you in the next video.